seconds. Okay, so before we get to Jim, um, this lecture series was um, very generously endowed by this gentleman right up here, Bill Lovejoy, uh, and that was back in 2016. And unfortunately, we just lost, um, well, I guess not just lost, but just late last year, we lost Bill. And he, um, he passed away, if you do the math, at the ripe old age of 95. And just like my own father, he had all his marbles and he was very, uh, you know, moving around and all, so he had a very full life. Um, I'm gonna read more than, um, more than we normally do to talk about Bill. Um, so let me just jump right in. William P. Bill Lovejoy was born in a small town, a small Ohio town, Neffs, which I'd never heard of, with fewer than a thousand people. Upon graduating from high school in 1945, he joined the Navy and served on the aircraft carrier, the USS Midway for the duration of the war. If any of you are World War II buffs, you will know about the Midway. I'm not gonna get into that. That's a very distinguished ship. Any rate, saw a lot of battles. Uh, since, uh, and then as Bill said, since he came from four generations of coal miners, by all accounts, he should have been a coal miner himself. But instead, uh, just like my father, because of the GI Bill, he became a first generation college graduate from Muskingum College in 1951 with a Bachelor of Science in Geology. Bill then went on to earn a master's degree in geology from the University of ne New Mexico in 1958, and then spent several years working as a field geologist for the Shell Oil Company before deciding that wasn't really for him, this geology, and he kind of liked more of the biology. So he moved, where am I here? Uh, he moved uh, to OSU to work on his PhD with the famous Doc Storm. Okay, he studied mountain beavers. This is a good one for everyone in this room. Mountain beavers, anyone heard of them? Boomers, Appledontia. Okay, who's actually seen one in real life? Oh, Mark has. I've never seen one in real life, actually, or in the field. Oh, Jesse has too. Okay. Yeah, very interesting critters. Uh, they're not actually beavers at all. Even though we're the beavers, they call them mountain beavers. They're not beavers. All right, back to Bill. He earned his PhD in 1975. What's that? What's what? What have I got? Oh, I'm missing that. I don't know. That's, that's typical. My daughter's already told. All right. He earned his PhD. In 1972, with his thesis research, a capture recapture analysis of a mountain beaver population in Western Oregon, Bill then began a faculty position, spent the rest of his academic career in the biology department at Georgia's, uh, Georgia Southern University, where he influenced generations of students with his teaching and research as a professor of biology uh, from 19... Uh, we have, I think we have our dates mixed up here, but anyway, it says 68 to 87. And then this is a quote from Bill. Doc, meaning Doc Storm, Doc had a rapport with students uh, both in and out of the classroom that I tried to emulate in my teaching career, said Lovejoy. Lovejoy was one of those students who was inspired and mentored by Doc Storm, describing him as a considerate, thoughtful advisor with strong friendships and connections to many former students and colleagues. And then a quote again, Doc built a strong community he was, he was easy to get to know, easy to work with, and well-liked, recalled Lovejoy. Inspired by his mentor in 2016, Bill Lovejoy established the Robert M. Storm Distinguished Lecture in Integrative Biology, an endowed series to promote excellence, advancement, and inspiration in biology, particularly vertebrate biology, to the OSU and Corvallis communities. By establishing this lecture series at Oregon State University, Bill said, I hope such inspiration will continue to motivate students for years to come. We are so grateful for Bill's generous gift in honor of his beloved mentor, Doc Storm, and we will truly miss this warm and wonderful man. All right. Well, that's, that's Bill. Now, did you get that, what you're supposed to be doing there, Jim? Yeah, I forget those things. That's a lot of stuff there. All right. Uh, so now it's a pleasure for me to introduce Jim Kanegi. And just right off the top, I will say, well, actually, I guess I'm going to get it in here. These are 
these are Becca's notes. Um, Jim said, just do the standard dry stuff. So we'll do all that stuff. So, all right. So our distinguished lecture, uh, lecturer uh, this year is Dr. Jim Kanegi from the University of Washington. Jim got his Bachelor of Arts in Zoology. I have a Bachelor of Arts as well. Bachelor of Arts in Zoology from Pomona College, 1967. PhD in Zoology from UCLA, 1972. He then went out, uh, overseas to do a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Behavioral Physiology. It says in Germany, we should do better now. Which one is that one? Is that, uh, say the, that's uh, Seavison. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say. All right. Uh, then uh, came back to California uh, and did uh, more postdoc work at UCLA and UCSD. And then Jim joined the Department of Zoology up at UW in 1976. And then uh, uh, you'll see had done a, a considerable amount of research there. But then in 1995, I guess he wasn't busy enough. So he, he expanded uh, and then took on uh, the role of the curator of mammals at the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. Jim's uh, work is he's really, really quite well known for uh, his work in, I guess we're, uh, we all wear a lot of hats these days, ecophysiology and behavior, population biology of mammals and biogeography and evolution of mammals. Publications, many, many. Books, Everyday Creatures, which is going to be available tonight after the lecture. And so it's, it really is a great honor for me to introduce Jim and my, as he's walking up, my own little, uh, uh, I obviously work, well, obviously some of you people know I work on snakes and so forth, but Jim was actually a kind of one of those mentors, even for me, I can very distinctly remember being a very scared grad student at what was then called the ASZ meetings and not the SICB meetings and going up and giving a talk and just having all these distinguished folks in there in the audience. And Jim would, went out of his way, he's a camel guy, to come back to come back afterwards or at a cost. Say, I just really loved your talk. That was great. Just, you know, you're just doing a great job. Just and then year after year you'd see him. You know, he didn't know me from Adam's house cat, but he did get to know me. So any rate. And so I know he was that way with lots of people. So Jim, I'm gonna give you the floor and thank you and on your way. Okay. I'm so sorry to interrupt the flow. Ricardo, what do you need me to? Share screen too. Share screen too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? There, I think. Oh, so I can have uh, oh, I got my view. Sorry. Oh. Oh. No, I, I want to, oh, good. So I can see my slide. Okay. So it's a, it's a vote. It's a rodent that lives in a family that has only one species in it. As I always taught in my mammalogy mal my course, the simple lesson, the mountain beaver is not a beaver and it doesn't live in the mountains. And I've seen a lot of them. It's a very interesting secretive animal that lives from southern British Columbia down to north of Berkeley along the Pacific coast. So it's an endemic uh, member of a monospecific family of strange, unusual rodents. The end. Well, hello, everybody. After my introductory lecture on mountain beavers, uh, thank you all for showing up for some stories about life in the desert. I've used the occasion of preparing this talk uh, to look back as an emeritus professor at my life as a graduate student. So this is, as I told some people today, my dissertation defense uh, relived many years later. But I hope you'll find something interesting in my experiences of uh, going out into the desert, trying to pay attention to nature and what it would teach me about what animals and plants are doing out there. There we go. But uh, first, uh, I want to express my thanks to the Department of Integrative Biology uh, for this very kind invitation 
and the honor of being associated with Doc Storm's legacy uh, by getting to address you in this lectureship uh, series. Uh, I met uh, Robert Storm in 1975 here on this campus in May. Uh, that's uh, almost 50 years ago. And he impressed me in a, in a lot of ways uh, that had a lasting impact, um, uh, particularly in the case of the time that I spent with him on that occasion with his enthusiasm for Eastern Oregon's Albert Desert. And we discovered that we shared some common interests uh, which he developed gradually over the course of his uh, career here at Oregon State University. Uh, and because of that bond and connection I formed with him on that occasion, I decided to allow his inspiration to lead me back to my own dissertation and to the general topic of life in the deserts, which will lead to rodents in the desert and my favorite animals, kangaroo rats and other such desert creatures. Well, our personal stories uh, that are personal involve our emotions. And I think that my emotional approach to nature interacts with my scientific curiosity, and I hope it's this way for other people. And all of that results in the formal, official, professional research that I've conducted, which is a response to what I just said. And from the perspective of a naturalist, uh, you just want to dive in and find what's going on with those animals. It's curiosity. What are they doing? Um, as a scientist, you may be guided, and I'll also say possibly misguided, by theoretical frameworks and hypothesis testing paradigms and the frightening research agendas prescribed by scientific funding agency programs. Uh, but don't forget, be a naturalist. All of those things can result in conflicts if we're really just concerned about seeking the truth of what's going on out in nature, which is what I think we really want to find uh, when we go out there. So finally, I have to say that being a naturalist and an academic scientist has been a lot of fun for me. And that's what I kind of want to share this evening. And a great deal of that also has to do with the people uh, involved in being a scientist, students that we work with in particular, and our professional colleagues who are our friends with whom we enjoy making scientific discoveries. Well, um, now Doc Storm. He was a great teacher and uh, inspirer of students. Getting out in the field and field trips and the commitment to field research is a big part of what he did. And I'm impressed with this department and its traditions in group field trips and course field trips and field research that so many of you are involved in. And I think it's a tribute to the legacy of Doc Storm that you all do what you do. And I hope you'll uh, continue doing that. Doc Storm showed up in 1939, and this is his master's thesis that he filed two years later. Uh, his master's and PhD, I didn't get a look at until I learned that I was coming on this occasion. I was curious uh, what he did when he showed up, coming from Illinois, and looking at what's right here in your backyard, the Mary's River Valley the effect of white man's settlement on wild animals in the Mary's River Valley. He did a synopsis of the flora and the fauna of what's right out around campus and up along the Mary's River Valley. I enjoyed the uh, it's called Avery Park area just across the street and going down to the shores and looking at the Mary's River yesterday and imagining that I was Doc Storm just showing up in 1939. Uh, he looked at historical records of the explorers to the area what they reported on the indigenous people and what they were doing, uh, setting fire to control environment, and then on to what the early settlers did. Uh, bad news, the decimation of the beaver along the Mary River, not good for Oregon State University, but uh, a fact of the intense trapping that, uh, that went on early along. And he just characterized, uh, just in this very local area, the stuff that he wrote up and filed in 19... 41, uh, uh, after two years of work, and then off he went to uh, World War II uh, to uh, serve in the serv service in Europe, uh, but came back. And so here's his PhD. Uh, Kenneth Gordon, his advisor, uh, said, okay, now you need to focus all the usual advice we give students when they're looking for a dissertation topic. How about 
reptiles and amphibians, herpetology. So his dissertation, filed in June of 1948, was the herpetology of Benton County, in which he got out and got acquainted with all the lizards and snakes and salamanders and frogs and toads, uh, one by one, species accounts of all of them uh, in terms of literature and what was known that he could read, and then getting acquainted with them and going out and find them. This is very worthy of a resurvey now, if anybody needs a new dissertation topic out there, and uh, a great representation of getting to know your own backyard as a naturalist and a scientist. Um, but he also eventually got interested in deserts, so this is our segue into a set of interesting tiles that are on the wall of a place where I like to hang out in Mexico, this Gibran quote uh, put into to Spanish, uh, which inspires me that if you're uh, singing about beauty and the loveliness of nature, even if you're stuck out in the middle of the desert, uh, you'll, somebody will listen to you. And the English translation gives me a chance to uh, thank all of you for being my audience and uh, hope that you will see some beauty in what I want to tell you about uh, this evening. Well, Oregon's deserts are beautiful, and the people of Oregon are very proud of uh, the dry country, sagebrush, juniper, and on across from central Oregon to the far east and the southeast, uh, the Albert Desert, that favorite spot of Doc Storms that he inspired me to think about where I ended up getting to do some work. But there's a rich uh, human history to the settlement, uh, surviving, getting along out there in rugged early years of ranching and other uh, things that uh, that happened in, in the early settlement. Um, this is the lovely spot of fields. There's the two-room motel. Things are, are kind of limited there, the floor of the Albert Desert going up to Steens. But here's Doc Storm's inspiration of fields, that little uh, station where you can get some gas or a hamburger or a milkshake uh, until they close at five o'clock and, and the town shuts down. Uh, but that's when you go south to Denio. Uh, oh, this is Andrews in the lower left, which has kind of gone extinct. There are the gas pumps at fields where I spent some time the, uh, a couple of years ago again. The, uh, the fields uh, mug, the annual mug produced there, the population uh, always remains below 10. Uh, and that's why Denio is a little more exciting for the culture uh, across the Nevada line, 25 miles to the south. And he particularly uh, told me about the Diamond Bar and the advantages of heading down there after a hard day's work to enjoy the Nevada culture. Uh, meanwhile, though, we're gonna get back to uh, desert ecology and lizards and snakes, and, and it's now about time after Bob's lecture on the mountain beaver and my talking about this stuff to move on. However, I have a personal story that I want to tell you about my family and my heritage in the Willamette Valley that involves the uh, settlement of all four sets of my great-grandparents in the Willamette Valley by the end of the uh, 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and something that's going to lead to a calling out to the desert. Uh, that has to do with stories that my grandfather told me when I was a young boy, his oldest grandson, my grandfather, Carnegie, about three years, 1905, 1906, and 1907, just upon the founding of Bend, uh, which happened then, uh, there was no Deschutes County. There was just a big crook county. Deschutes County came in 1916. There's no Bend or Redmond on this map, but there's a Prineville and there's a Sisters. And in those three summers from the farm up in Clackamas County, my grandfather and two of his brothers and their father, my great grandfather, got in a wagon with a couple of horses and headed up to Portland uh, where they got, oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing uh, a little bit of other stuff. I wanna tell you about the earlier family, I'm sorry. Uh, the the other branches of the family, this is one of my great grandparents operations over in North Albany in the Oregon State Archives, a prune drying facility in the 1920s. Uh, the Kanegi family here is on the Kalapuya River somewhere between Albany and Corvallis for a little boat ride in the 1930s. And then my uh, Jersey dairy farmer grandparents out on Knox Butte Road east of Albany with this great barn and silo and my own experience getting to know uh, farm animals as a young boy 
this was the heritage of my family. And now I go on with, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm out of order. I have one Oregon State legacy. This is my father in 1939 in the spring before Doc Storm showed up in the fall. Notice that the beaver sportswear already had a rather angry and ferocious looking beaver in 1939 when my father uh, completed his one and only year before he also had to get involved in the aircraft industry associated with the war and leave without getting any further study here in the great state of the beavers. And now that I'm paying attention to my slides, I'll, I'll get back to what happened when uh, this uh, grandfather of mine and his brothers with my great grandfather left the red dot up in the top there up by Needy and Hubbard where he had been born to go up to the Columbia River uh, uh, and spend the night in Portland and get on the Bailey Gatsert Stern Wheeler. He told me the name of that thing. And I was surprised when I put all this history together uh, uh, as a, uh, recently, and as I've been getting ready to come and talk to you folks, that uh, he that that boat actually existed. And I had written this down when I was a graduate student, uh, having him retell me these stories of going up there, getting out of the Dallas uh, locks and spending the night at the, at the sorry at the Dalles, and then heading south through do for do for various sagebrush country, getting into junipers and finally into Ponderosa, a bit to the uh, to the east of Sisters, to a homestead that they were granted for free government land from the federal government. They had to pay for water rights to begin a farm. And for three summers, they uh, put up fence in order to establish uh, themselves. And here is the dam in the lower left that Mr. Laidlaw, the land developer, uh, built and, and charged everybody to uh, to pay for the water rights, there was a little geological problem that the dam did not hold water because it all percolated down through the basalt. And Mr. Laidlaw was hung in effigy, which was the, one of the most frightening things that my grandfather ever told me because I didn't know that that meant he wasn't really lynched, that, uh, you know, that he was hung in effigy. Uh, so there were some difficult times uh, they were getting the fence out. A horse died one summer. They had to borrow a horse to get back home. And eventually my great-grandfather said, you know, this just isn't going to work. But Mr. Laidlaw kept on promising that he could make it work. So my great-grandfather was able to sell his homestead uh, for something uh, to help cover the water, the money he'd lost from water rights. Uh, but it failed again, and Mr. Laidlaw was hung in effigy a second time. And the town has been renamed Tumalo, which some of you may know. And you can go out and drive right up onto the top of that dam and look at that dam dam. And it's still there and there's no water behind it. Uh, but anyway, this gave a calling to my uh, grandfather and to my parents to return to the desert. And even though my, my great grandfather uh, settled in Albany eventually and my grandparents in Albany, uh, My grandfather in 1938 had a response to the desert, which was that in 1913, the legislature uh, banned antelope hunting because the populations had declined. But in 1938, they opened a season and there is my grandfather who put in and got a tag to go do the first antelope hunt, the first modern antelope hunt in 1938 with a hunting partner. And they returned successfully uh, from that antelope hunt in the first year that that opened up. That was the calling to the desert that my grandfather had. And 10 years later in 1948, my parents decided to settle in Central Oregon. And so I ended up in Bend and then finally Redmond where I attended first through eighth grade and uh, fell in love with sagebrush and juniper. So that when Doc Storm told me that things were good out there and if I went further east, uh, I would find uh, the promised land in the Alvord Desert. I had been working in a similar environment that I'm going to tell you about uh, 350 miles south of the Alvord Desert in the northern Mojave that is a very similar habitat and has some of the very same desert rodents that are in the Alvord. So it's the comparison between those places that's been of interest to me. And that's the end of my personal story of calling out to the desert. And it's time to start talking about desert ecology. This first part is easy. It's hot, it's dry, 
and things are unpredictable. Uh, we all understand that. The Western part of the United States is the more arid uh, part of our North American continent. Uh, the state of Oregon blown up here, you can see uh, in the Alvord Desert area is about nine inches of rain annually. Look at the Steens Mountains though, there's a big difference when you get up in elevation and capture water there. But deserts to the south like the Mojave are more like five or six uh, um, inches of rain a year. And in the Sonoran and other deserts, six inches or even less. So we get a little bit more in this Great Basin Desert area up here. But what are the effects of this on the plants? First of all, before we talk about the animals, well, there's not a lot of biomass. The shrubs are spaced out of low density. They can have shallow roots that grab water really quick when they're uh, brief and occasional rain, or some in some areas may have deep roots that go into a, a deeper water pool. Uh, there's storage of water in plants like the cactus. Uh, the leaves of most desert shrubs and annuals are small and tough and well protected and there are chemical defenses and spiny mechanisms on a lot of desert shrub that protect them from herbivores. There's a lot of plant physiology that is very uh, conservator of the water that the plants do get so they don't lose water as fast as tropical or uh, temperate area. Uh, vegetation. And of course, the growth and reproduction are very seasonal in desert environments for plants and animals, as we'll see. And then some are capable of physiological, physiological dormancy, just not operating when it gets too hot or too cold, or of, uh, of course, uh, being uh, deciduous and just giving up on leaves and letting them go away when it gets hot. The annual plants, um, I won't say they have it easy. Sometimes in droughts, they don't even show up. But in other years, they're well protected and very happy if a seed can be happy, just existing as a population of seeds in the ground. And that's going to be a key bridge to our favorite desert rodents who are specialists on feeding in all of that seed bank out there that's sitting in the desert waiting for kangaroo rats to feed on. Uh, so the animal populations, not just the desert rodents, uh, many animals are nocturnal, uh, not all of them. They live, the smaller ones, in underground burrows, including arthropods, insects, and little invertebrate creatures. But lizards, snakes, and rodents are all have underground burrows to live in. They have physiological adjustments, some of which I'll talk about, uh, for water conservation, uh, seasonal reproduction. Uh, the birds, they can go away uh, after a nice breeding season in a lush springtime uh, period in the desert. Uh, uh, some of the small mammals are, are hibernators and can drop out during the, the dry part or, or otherwise uh, get into some state of physiological dormancy. So the deserts in North America are uh, more than just our Great Basin Desert. But here's a map of uh, Great Basin, Mojave, Sonora, and Chihuahuan Deserts. Different people draw different versions of this map. But there is the Alvord Desert and our southeastern Oregon uh, area represented in the dot. Uh, but let's talk about the Great Basin because the special name of this desert uh, is important because basin means an internal drainage area that is neither part of the Columbia River drainage nor the Colorado River where uh, water doesn't run out into the sea or transport off to another major part of the continent, but it will uh, evaporate or dry in that area. The most common shrub in the Great Basin, those areas you just saw, is the Great Basin sagebrush. Uh, of which there's a photo here. And on the right is a pressed plant museum specimen from our uh, University of Washington Museum. And this is my first time to tell you that after the talk, we'll have in the lobby a set of three demonstration tables on one of which there are gonna be three of these different uh, important desert shrubs, starting with the Great Basin sage uh, and two others I'll tell you about. We're also going to have a, a lizard and snake table and a couple of rodent tables. And I'll cue you on some of the things I'm going to talk about that you'll have a chance to look at uh, afterwards. The next thing to say about the Great Basin, click, is the areas where the internal drainage concentrates salts and produce salt flats. And I've circled some of these that are important in the particularly the three uh, southern eastern counties in Oregon. Uh, uh, there was a salt industry, in fact, associated with these, and there's recent uh, issues with the Abert uh, Dry Lake and the preservation of these interesting uh, salt lake environments. 
environments in the salt flats where only some rather specialized kind of uh, shad scale and salt loving vegetation can exist, which leads to this, the spiny salt bush, one of the iconic species. And there's an herbarium specimen you can go look at of, uh, uh, of a preserved museum specimen of plants. So you can see how those are preserved for natural history museums and some photos of salt bush at different times of year. These photos are from my California site, but this very same species is in the Alvord. And there are a whole lot of parallels between a lot of the stuff I'm gonna tell you about desert rodents and what we find in the Alvord Desert where I've enjoyed working more recently. Well, what distinguishes each of these four major uh, deserts? Well, just geography, different areas and the climate. And then these academic matters, which I will call different kind of botanists and zoologists uh, specialized in different kind of organisms like to group together animals and see which ones occur in different areas. They don't occur in some areas if they're endemic or only found in a certain desert, how many species are shared. And so numerous analyses have done, been done that produce somewhat different maps that different uh, biogeographers would produce. Doc Storm, very importantly taught a course called zoogeography that Becca Terry now teaches called biogeography. And she includes a few plants, in fact, and not just animals, how we analyze the geographic distributional patterns. And I'm gonna show you a couple such analyses for lizards and snakes and for desert rodents in the, in the Alvar Desert. But across all of our deserts, other than the Great Basin, Here's our third botanical specimen, the creosote bush, which is considered to be sort of the most common and widespread desert shrub in not the Great Basin, but the Mojave, the Sonora, and the Chihuahuan Desert. So get to know the creosote bush and its tiny, tough, uh, pungent, uh, oily, smelly leaves. It has nothing to do with the creosote on railroad ties, but because it's so pungent and and, and reprehensible, it was given the nasty name of that product that's used to uh, keep uh, termites from eating railroad ties out in the desert, a uh, creosote bush. Uh, some of the other kind of plants that are not Great Basin, but if you get down into the Mojave, the agaves, the yuccas, the acatillos, some of you heard of these or know, and of course, many cactus that are uh, uh, diverse and more extensive uh, cactus groups in the other deserts. Uh, although we have them in, in the Great Basin, of course. There's an acatillo on the left and some cactus. And then look at the thing on the right. That's not an agave. That's not a yucca. That's actually in the Chihuahuan Desert, a bromeliad. It's something in the, in the pineapple family that looks like a yucca and so on. And that's only in the Chihuahuan Desert. Okay, so the Mojave is the little desert south of the Great Basin in between the Sonoran Desert, which has its elements in the... Uh, Southern Arizona and actually Southeast California, if you know uh, the Anza Borrego Desert, and on down into the Baja California Peninsula with the Red Star. Uh, and then uh, uh, what's left? The Chihuahua and Desert uh, across New Mexico and into Texas and on down through the Mexican highlands. Uh, then there are deserts all around the world, and only very briefly, after you can see in the circle, our North American deserts in the Southwest generally. Uh, climatic patterns of ocean currents and air movements produce drying effects that have produced some of the desert regions at about 30 degrees latitude north and south, but there are other climatic factors that have produced, well, 30 degrees north, the Sahara Desert, uh, and in South Africa, that's the, uh, the uh, sorry, in, in Australia, the, the driest and hottest deserts there as well. And um, we're now ready, though, to come back, and we'll, we'll return a little bit to some world deserts. We're ready to come back to Doc Storm's Albert Desert Reptiles. Uh, he collected out there, and in fact, uh, if you go to the reptile, the, the lizard and snake table, you will see specimens that he collected uh, in uh, the Albert and other uh, desert parts of southeastern Oregon. Uh, just as a representation of how you analyze the fauna, uh, here are the five most common lizards of the low, low basic Alvord Basin. There are little lizards uh, down below that eat insects and bugs and so on. And then the bigger lizards eat the littler lizards. And there's interesting community structure of how many lizards there are. The three most common snakes are the, the rattler, and a gopher snake, and a striped whip snake. And these eight reptiles are sort of the core 
uh, minimal concentration. As soon as you get up into the rocks and get out of the basin, you immediately find twice as many species. And if you spend a couple of weeks looking everywhere, a little ways up and down, you can get almost 20 species of reptiles out there and some amphibians as well, some desert toads and so on. But this, this basic set of six most common, of, of eight most common, are available for you to look at out on the, on the lizard and snake table, as well as a little table like this that is an example of the analysis that Doc Storm pointed out to me in 1975 when he pointed out that the Alvar Desert is an exciting place because it's the northern outpost of certain lizards and snake, snakes, and as I learned later, certain rodents. Uh, so the Alvar Desert yes column, four of those species, uh, are found no further north. And so it's a chance to go out to one part of Oregon where you can see stuff that only exists further to the south in other deserts. And then you compare into the Mojave, Sonoran, and Chihuahuan Desert that actually five of the, liz of the lizard and snake species that you find in the Alvar Desert, you can also find in the Chihuahuan Desert. So those are widespread desert forms, but a number of them are at their very northern limit in the Alvar Desert, and some occur in the Mojave and Sonora. So this is biogeographic analysis and comparing North American uh, 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 biogeography of, of reptiles. Uh, it's something I'll do for you in a few minutes for the rodents out there. Uh, but I want to say that lizards played an important part in my getting interested in biology as a freshman. And this little piece from uh, my Everyday Creatures book is what happened to me when I was a freshman. Driving toward Palm Springs on a spring day in 1964, near the end of my freshman year in college, my fellow student comrades and I were not in fact escaping for a weekend getaway to the culture of the famous desert resort town. This was instead freshman general zoology 51B led by our young professor, especially known as Dr. Mack, the professor had prepared us ahead of time for the fascinating announcement that we would be searching the scorching sands of the low, lower Mojave Desert among widely spaced creosote bushes to find and capture lizards, specifically the desert iguana, Dipsosaurus dorsalis. Well, we got on a yellow school bus and went out and found lizards and did a kind of a strange thing that I'll describe very briefly and for which you can see the methodology on our lizard table. We took the body temperature of lizards after noosing them, we used a little noose you use to catch them, and you can go out and see what a lizard noose looks like and what a lizard thermometer looks like that allowed us to document as freshman zoology students that in the morning, the lizards were kind of cool when they first came out in the sun, but as the morning got on and things heated up, the body temperatures of the lizards were hotter than human body temperature. And for some of us who thought that lizards were cold-blooded animals, this was a revelation that a lizard could be warmer than a human. Well, that's a pretty simple physiology lesson, but it was my introduction to the fun of catching lizards and of inserting a thermometer into their body to take their temperature, uh, which you'll learn how to do when you go out to the lizard table afterwards. Um, that was my freshman experience. That got me interested in lizards. It got me interested in zoology and this professor who I'll throw this in, he is still alive, living in Talon, Oregon. I still have one of my undergraduate professors uh, in his 90s with me at 77 that I can still pick up the phone and talk to. The, the next year, uh, I had to get in this guy's course, which was Animal Ecology, was the course name I spotted in the college catalog description for Zoology 157 in the spring semester of 1965, grabbed me even more with the promise of desert animals. It was desert ecology. I was thrilled to receive permission to enroll from the professor who had taken me out to see the lizards the year before. Uh, this was a year in which I got introduced to kangaroo rats, and I'm finally going to get to talk about them in a little bit, as well as deserts. And uh, it wasn't just the Mojave Desert. In this spring field course, when I also was signed up for a geology course and a botany field course in the same time of my sophomore year, took us at Memorial Day weekend up to Nevada, where we uh, saw a Great Basin Desert. And at spring vacation before that, we didn't go goof off at the beach. We got in the uh, departmental uh, field vehicle and headed off to uh, the Guaymas area in the Mexican state of Sonora to the Sonoran Desert, where we caught lizards and caught kangaroo rats. And so in the sophomore 
year experience on field trips, I got introduced to the animals I'll tell you more about and to three of North America's uh, major deserts. And very quickly, you can't do everything sophomore year in college. Only last fall for the first time, I got to the Chihuahua Desert, Big Bend uh, National Park in Texas, uh, where I've got the arrow pointing was a joy to see after all the years it took me finally to get to the Chihuahua Desert. So uh, that's part of my inspiration. These are museum specimens that you can see of five of the most common uh, rodents all in one family, two kangaroo rats at the top, a little thing called a kangaroo mouse, and then two pocket mice. I'll talk about them a little bit more of specialized, generally seed eating desert rodents all five of these are found in the Albert Desert, uh, belonging to one family. And then besides those are a, a, a day active animal, the little chipmunk looking antelope ground squirrel and the deer mouse, the most, common, uh, uh, the most common rodent in Western North America. So these seven species that you can see on the small mammal Albert Desert table will be available for you to look at as museum specimens. Uh, uh, tended to by uh, one of the graduate students, Jesse, who's actually doing his dissertation on these animals, not only at the Alvar Desert, but he's surveying 23 different sites on up all the way to the top of uh, Steens Mountains uh, for the variety of additional species. And again, beyond these seven are 20 or so species of rodents that occur at different elevations and different kind of habitats. But we'll give you a chance to, to look at this minimal uh, uh, Alvord Desert Basin rodent fauna consisting of five species in this one specialized family of the kangaroo rats that I'm going to be telling you more about. Here's a similar chart showing you that four of those species are at their northern geographic limit. Uh, only two of them occur in the Chihuahuan Desert. And uh, this is the sort of uh, comparative biogeography chart that I won't discuss any further. But uh, it's again, what makes the Alvar Desert special is that it has species there that don't occur any further north uh, that are representatives of other, other de desert systems. Okay. Oh, that thing, okay. Oh, where did those guys show up from? Okay, yeah, we've got my email is coming up in here. Okay, back to, sorry, I just have to check email. Um, now, a little bit more about just not animals in general, but desert rodents in particular. Again, nocturnal activity, most of them underground burrows. Highlighted is the water independence that, and, uh, that has very specialized mechanisms I'll show you a little bit about later. And the dietary specialization, I already mentioned that most of them are seed eaters, very typical. Then this bipedal locomotion, I want to introduce you to kangaroo lat like lo locomotion for rapid commuting speeds or erratic jumping to escape from predators, uh, which gives kangaroo rats their kangaroo rat name and the, the Latin generic name dipodomies, meaning a two-footed mouse, if you can dissect that Latin. Or, uh, and you see these big feet in the tail. Now I'm gonna introduce you uh, visually with some little clips that I managed to get digitized from 16 millimeter movies that I shot decades ago. So you can see the bipedality standing up on two big hind feet and the interesting long tail that serves as a counterbalance when these animals move. I ended up getting some pictures underneath so you can see other stuff they do by putting a 45 degree mirror under an aquarium and then pointing the camera into that. So if you throw the animal in, now you're looking at the bottom and you can see what an animal is going to do. And I'm going to be showing you quite a bit of what they do. Uh, here, for example, is how tiny the front feet are. They can be used for feed handling, for food handling, and for grooming. There's some nice grooming behavior. But look how huge the hind feet are. They're as big and long as half the body length. Now, another interesting feature of kangaroo rats and their other family members, the pocket mice, also shared by the family of pocket gophers that we have in the in the Willamette Valley are cheek pouches. And these are cheek pouches that are not like chipmunk cheek pouches or hamster pouches inside the mouth where this stuff happens like this when they put food in their mouth. These are little pockets totally outside the mouth. And I have to show you this by a lightly anesthetized animal whose pouches I stick in there and kind of pull out. 
And you can see their lined with fur, and this is not the mouth. This is out on the side of the head. If, you've, if your cat ever drags in a pocket gopher, uh, pick up the dead gopher and, and look, and you can do this thing that I'm doing with this expansible pocket. And now I'm gonna pull this. You see how expansible it is? They look like ears, but they're not. Uh, those are the external cheek pouches, expansible. And now we have to see what happens when a seed-eating kangaroo rat like Dipodomys merimai is given a bunch of these. This animal is not eating. Look how fast that is. It's stuffing them into the cheek pouches that allows the animal to go foraging and finding the food and then return to its safe burrow to enjoy dinner underground in a protected environment. Now, what happens when they get loaded up? This, this guy is filled up with cheek pouches and I want him to give up the seeds. And he's gonna do that by pushing, I call this the jackpot, pushing on the side of the face. So now he's gonna have a little snack there at the end. And those are the seeds that he dumped out. We're gonna come back to a little more eating and, and kangaroo rat food handling, but the pocket mice, are also in this family, also have, that's why they're called pocket mice, and why our gophers in a different family are called pocket gophers. The little guy on the left, uh, the little pocket mouse, very apt name, is basically the smallest rodent in North America at about a quarter of, a, a quarter of an ounce, six or seven grams. It's about the size of a peanut. It's about that long. And you can see the specimen, the museum specimen of the little pocket mouse from the Alvar Desert, which was also one of the animals that I studied in my dissertation work. Kangaroo mice, uh, are, are, there, there are, by the way, there are about 20 some species of kangaroo rats that all look the same thing. There are 30 or more species of pocket mice, maybe 35 or 40. There are only two species of kangaroo mice, microdipodops, a funny little name. It means a, a micro little two-footed creature. But look at that little guy. He's a lot smaller than a kangaroo. Half of his body is head, half of his body is rump, and half the length of his body is his little kangaroo-like kangaroo -like feet. But then you look at the skull, which you can see out at our demo table, uh, those big circles, and the one I've highlighted in red, is the ear capsule, the otic capsule that contains the middle ear bones. These animals, uh, kangaroo rats, pocket mice, and uh, the microdipodops uh, have a specialization for low frequency sounds that are typical of owl wing beats. And they are great at hearing though that rush as something they can avoid for predator avoidance. There's some special behavioral studies have been done to demonstrate that. So they have got excellent low frequency hearing. And that's why the skulls look so doggone weird and have these big, huge balls on them. And the, uh, the tiny little animals have such gigantic skulls. It's because of their hearing capsule. The kidney, I have to talk about a little bit as being very different. I'm saying there's this specialized physiology. Uh, you may know the name of the filtering glomerulose of the kidney out in the cortex that filters all of the urine and the, the stuff that doesn't belong in the blood and turns it into urine but that costs a lot of water. And kangaroo rats and some other desert rodents have a specialized internal deep part of the kidney called the loops of Henley down here, which in a kangaroo rat would go way down to the floor and come back. And I'm gonna show you somebody else who doesn't have good ones in just a minute, uh, warning. Uh, and it's through the process of the capillaries along the uh, ascending and descending limb that reclaim the water through a special uh, osmotic mechanism back into the bloodstream so that the urine that is produced is very, very concentrated and the animal reclaims water. And uh, there is a picture of a kangaroo rat kidney with these very long loops of Henle and a very deep me medullary medulla part of the cortex is the outer part of the kidney. And now for those of you who are here, this morning, this is our first beaver moment of the evening. Uh, this is a beaver medulla, no loops of Henley, almost no. Now, this is not to shame the beaver. Where does the beaver live? The beaver lives in water, the beaver drinks water. And so once again, there's modesty and appropriateness in beaver biology, not to bother with loops of Henley because they don't have to conserve water. So I'll have one more reference to beavers in my talk. 
as I've felt to be an obligation being with you people of this nation. Um, onward. Oops. There, I have to read my email again. There we go. Okay, this is me back in dissertation days, 350 miles south of the Albert, and I'm going to get into finally some discoveries and things that happened to me. I spent uh, nights out in the desert trapping at intervals of two or three hours, off and on during the night. This is a nocturnal shot, actually, of the little town of Big Pine about five miles away. Under starlight and moonlight, I, I got where I could walk around in the dark without needing a flashlight because my eyes would get used to it, checking the traps and getting the animals um, to produce uh, this one of my papers based on what I was trying to do to understand the daily and seasonal patterns of activity and energy expenditure. And on the left, you see two species of kangaroo rats, uh, one of which the microps, and then this little pocket mouse live in the Alvar Desert as well. But this is in California's Owens Valley of the populations over a three-year period. And I studied the bouts of reproduction represented by uh, male and female kangaroo rats here showing their late winter reproduction in response to the winter precipitation. I'm not going to do that at length, but a big deal for me was studying what was very popular in the 60s and 70s, the organization of communities of multiple species of animals. Uh, in fact, that particularly goes for a whole bunch of people who were studying desert rodent seed eaters uh, in the Sonoran Desert, in the Great Basin Desert, and studying how big species, little medium species, medium mediums, smaller mediums, and small species would all fit together and uh, exploit the resources of seeds differently. For example, this graph showing that the big species eat big seeds, and the medium species eat medium-sized seeds, and the little species eat little seeds and that when you study where the animals move around, the big kangaroo rats are far out from the bushes running around fast on their two hind feet, and other pocket mice may feed closer to bushes, and some of the small rodents are specialized for always looking around under bushes for food. And ecology in general, whether it was marine ecology or desert ecology, was alive with people trying to understand the structure of communities and how resources could be divided up so that multiple species could live in the same environment and, and survive as uh, uh, specialists on different axes of resource utilization. Um, I'm now going to tell you about what happens very quickly with a couple of quick pictures to uh, other desert rodent systems other than our Western North American deserts. And look at this, folks. Look at these funny looking things with big feet, long tails, sandy color. None of these are kangaroo rats. These are from Africa, from the Mongolian desert, from Australia, from Argentina. These are uh, gerboas. These are gerbils. These are uh, hopping mice, other names rodents that belong to completely different families and except for being rodents are unrelated to kangaroo rats and this kind of pattern throughout a whole lot of different kind of organisms we call parallel or convergent evolution where a set of factors like desert aridity availability of seeds resources produces faunas that respond in a similar way evolving similar behavior and similar morphology and big gangly feet and long tails and running around on two hind feet and big long loops of Henley. All of these phenomenon in our Northwestern, our uh, North American deserts have, re have appeared over some cases, greater amounts of time in other world deserts. And we'll come back to that just a little bit briefly, but this is to tell you the excitement of a global view of what happens to seed resources when there's a big uh, set of uh, rodent species that can evolve in, in a different area. Here's a, sort of a cartoon showing all of the different continents that have their kangaroo rat-like uh, rodents uh, around the world and the differences in the family with the arrow pointing to the heteromyidae and the closely related uh, geomyidae families that we have in North America. Interestingly, Right alongside the kangaroo rat family and the pocket grove family is the beaver family. The, the beaver group is uh, actually closely related to kangaroo rats among 
uh, all these creatures. Uh, now we're getting into the final stages of surprise and discovery. And what I call in one of my book chapters, the underground mysteries of kangaroo. And I briefly have to tell you something that I was supposed to do that I figured I wanted to do that I did and that I published all about having to do with where do they nest? What do they do all winter? Uh, where do they hang out in the soil? Uh, that caused me eventually to have to excavate burrows to find out what's going on underground. <clears throat> the questions had to do with uh, the temperature profile of the soil and where animals hung out, which turns out to be, and I'll just qualitatively describe this, after uh, embedding probes down into the ground so that I could measure the temperatures every month, you see over the three years of my dissertation, uh, cooling temperatures, right? So here's the summer, here's the winter. But in fact, uh, you can probably imagine this. In the cold of winter, it gets warmer the deeper you go. And in the hot of summer, it gets hotter as you come up. Here are profiles like oceanographers take of uh, temperatures with depth, showing you as you go down to a meter and a half in the winter, it's warmer. And as you go higher, it's colder, getting down to freezing. Uh, within 40 centimeters of the surface, uh, there are fluctuations during the day, but as soon as you get below that, the temperature never changes more than a degree. So in, in summer, then it is cooler as you go deeper. So I, and then in the spring and the fall, there's a uniformity. Um, so I wanted to know how deep the animals were. And to do that, we didn't have good radio telemetry at the time. I found out through some good advice, uh, something that a number of people were using to track animals, which is to get briefly radioactive materials, in this case, gold 198 isotope, put this little hot uh, gamma emitting wire into a rat who would, th and then the, the radioactivity would only last for a short period. It would all be gone within three weeks. We discovered this did not damage the animals. We tested them in any event. So I had earphones and a Geiger counter going around finding kangaroo rats, but calibrating the uh, intensity of the radiation so I knew how deep they were. So I was able to show that they occupied efficient and metabolically appropriate different amb ambient temperatures by locating differently. And, and in the winter, for example, there were kangaroo rats down as nearly five or six feet in the ground where it was warmer. Also, they all occupied nests. Well, so that was one big part of my thesis to do that that led me to the point after even some re some automatic recording and running a generator and recorder that recorded them moving around with the uh, activity, uh, radioactivity, that I, I needed after investigating them as a summer in the same burrows, how the same individual animal, by the way, I did this in an area that was apart from where I had all the animals marked that were part of my mark and recapture study. And this got me into the ground with cutting edge techniques, uh, cutting edge technique being the shovel, uh, which I used, uh, that's a bad metaphor, uh, but this shows uh, an example of places where I found uh, the animals in the summer lower down uh, um, uh, because it was too warm near the surface and just different resting chambers. And then I found nests. And this is where the surprises started to come and, and a new discovery. Uh, that is actually the first chapter of my book because some of the best discoveries are not what you were planning to do, but it's the secrets of spiny saltbush, the shrub that I already introduced you to, and the fact that in these burrows I found underneath the nests, not of the seed-eating Merriam kangaroo rat, but of the chisel-tooth kangaroo rat, the very strange debris material. When I pull out the nest, here's this strange... Uh, well, kind of pungent and interesting smelling material that uh, I couldn't understand what it was. It didn't look like anything I knew. It was sort of chartreuse covered. And uh, I sort of figured, I got, what is this? And uh, why doesn't the Merriam kangaroo rat have this? Uh, then I found a cache of the leaves of the spiny salt bush. Uh, I removed all of this stuff. Here's a picture of over a pound of the mysterious material that I started wondering uh, if it was some kind of 
food processing, you know, like sauerkraut or like silage. It reminded me of what I smelled in my grandfather's silo. Have any you've ever climbed in a silo? And it's a it's an amazing, wonderful smell, you know. And uh, I, I didn't know what it was, so I, I I really got going for a couple of months, and I of course finding the leaves of salt bush. It was a little incriminating to uh, give some to an animal and see if uh, it would eat them. And uh, so here's a 24 hour test of a whole bunch of si spiny salt bush twigs that I threw in a cage. And here's the animal. After 24 hours, the animal weighed more than it did when I put it in there. It ripped apart all these shrubs, all these twigs. And then look, here is that funny looking material that I found below the nest of the animals. And uh, things were beginning to fall in place here that these guys are obviously eating these leaves, but they weren't eating all of them. Now I took the seed eating kangaroo rat and gave it the same thing. And after 24 hours, it had totally torn up all the twigs very nervously, but there was none of the strange little material in there. And in fact, the guy was not looking very good and he had lost weight. So I decided he was not eating saltbush leaves. And I gave him some food and let him go in the desert so he could resume his happy life, uh, I guess, as a typical, typical seed eating kangaroo rat. Well, I had to find out more about what's going on. And that included sitting quietly and paying a little more attention out in the desert to the fact that, look, they're climbing up in the bushes and they're picking the leaves of the salt bush. And then I had to get my 16 millimeter camera ready to see what they do when they're up in the twig. And look, this is cheek pouches. He's not eating anything. He's he's pulling the the leaves off of the twig and shoving them in the cheek pouches, which could be carried back. Now he gets a little carried away, deciding he needs to break the twig, which he shouldn't ordinarily do. Out in, come on, okay, back to work. Get the leaves in your pouch. He he puts the leaves in the pouch, and then um, it was time to to see what happens if I. Well, can you can you eat this stuff? So, uh, hello. Just a minute. We're gonna get a. Oops. Oh, we need the arrow back over. Here we go. Whoop. No. Point. It's the end of that. There we go. Oh, sorry. That. Uh, sorry. We get to see that again. But there we go. Now, now I've given the guy a leaf, and we're gonna see what he does with a leaf. He's holding the leaf and he's producing the strange material. He's quivering his lower incisors very delicately and running the leaf over the incisors. Now watch, he flipped the leaf and this bright green color is appearing, which you're probably guessing this is gonna be what the animal eats. So it's removing the upper and the lower surface both of the atroplex leaf. It takes about 20 seconds to get through one leaf. By the way, the, the family Chenopodiaceae or Am Am uh, um, Amaranthaceae now is the family of spinach and chard. So if you like spinach and chard, eat it. It's the same as what these kangaroo rats eat, except you don't have to shave off the surface. So there we go, munching away after this effort of removing the external uh, surface of the leaves. Uh, see. Now, you notice we call this animal a chisel tooth kangaroo rat. These are Merriam kangaroo rat lower incisors. These are the lower incisors over which the animal was moving those leaves. And the chisel tooth kangaroo rat is the only one of 20 some species of kangaroo rats that has these wide, flat, chisel shaped incisors. And all the other kangaroo rat species have incisors like that. Uh, beaver moment. Uh, this, these are the incisors of North America's largest rodent capable of cutting down trees. So uh, rodent incisors can do a lot of different things. These cut down trees and these delicate little things shave off saltbush leaves. And on one of the rodent, the rodent table of the chisel tooth, you can visit beaver incisors there. Uh, I think uh, Benny needs to see his orthodontist there. It's a little bit of an overbite, but he's a cute little guy. And if you've never touched uh, and want to handle a beaver skull, uh, that's my final beaver moment. Uh, here I am holding uh, Dipodomys microps out in the Albert Desert. You can see the 
the flat incisors there, the beautiful Albert environment and the cheek pouch. A very special animal. Here's a quick little video of me with a scalpel uh, shaving off, as the incisors do, that silvery white, as we'll see when we do a chemical analysis, uh, salt-laden external tissue. Let's move along and we do the, the, the cross-section microscope work. Up here is one of the shavings. There's the epidermis of the leaf. And this is a leaf that I took away from a kangaroo rat after it sheared off this thing and before it sheared off that size. So this histology work was done uh, by a kangaroo rat and then by a microscope uh, uh, technical preparation uh, uh, slide. Uh, I did the chemistry, which uh, inter shows this huge level of salt concentration on the discarded outer leaves. Many desert plants and most plants in general exclude sodium at the roots in the ground and don't even bring it in. But uh, the, these uh, halophytic salt loving plants bring it in, run it through the system and then excrete it out through the epidermis onto the surface as a protection of the leaves. And one of the big excitements uh, that made these leaves so interesting to uh, scientists at the time was the special uh, kind of uh, uh, photosynthesis that was being analyzed and discovered in the time I was doing this work with atroplex plants in, in particular. Uh, this shows you how concentrated the urine is of the seed-eating kangaroo rat. The chisel-tooth kangaroo rat doesn't have as long loops of Henle and can't concentrate urine uh, as extensively. 12 times the concentration of blood plasma by the, uh, the seed eater and the, the chisel tooth concentrates its urine only about seven times because it has a lot of water that it gets in its food. food. Uh, the young uh, animals every year are born following these pregnancies. The young uh, chisel tooth kangaroo rats come out onto the surface at about this time when the leaves of salt bush are new growing leaves on the bushes with a high water content. And so as, as youngsters foraging on salt bush, they can in ingest the entirety of the leaves of the salt bush that grows each spring. And then as salt is excreted onto the leaves, they end up having to uh, learn how to do the chiseling as part of their development. Uh, and the leaves dry up and get the great salt concentrations for most of the year. So that's a little lesson in, uh, in child development for leaf eating kangaroo rats. Well, I uh, uh, managed to uh, publish this story in an interesting magazine that's not well known for publishing natural history notes. Uh, 50 years ago, this last December, and the editors chose my picture of the cross section of the atroplex leaf. And I was sorry they didn't feature the kangaroo rat in, in a bigger way, but he did make it on the cover of Science Magazine. I headed off to Germany. I was happy to have made this discovery. I published another paper about that. But then I heard about some desert rodents in uh, North Africa that I tried to go study and wasn't able to, but I got teeth to look at of the fat sand rat, a gerbil. Of all the gerbils, it has lower incisors that are flat. And so it was gradually discovered and worked on by other people that in one of the other deserts with kangaroo rat-like rodents, there's a rodent that feeds on saltbush leaves. And then a few years later in Argentina, this little viscacha rat was discovered to be eating atroplex out in the desert here. And lo and behold, its incisors, unlike all the other rodents of its family, are chisel shaped and flat. And then a really interesting uh, kick that they threw in that isn't even teeth, these, these little viscacha rats have got some little bristles on the edge of the mouth that they also use for helping to shave off the salt. So um, that's the end of my kangaroo rat stories. And the last little note is just to explain why there's a darkling beetle out on the lizard table uh, that one of the chapters, in one of the chapters of my book, uh, I describe how we took a bunch of students out uh, measured body temperature in Eastern Washington of, of some beetles that I, I really don't have time to talk about now. Uh, but some of the funnest teaching that I ever did, including teaching physiology, was uh, taking students out on field trips. So we, we had this entire class during the springtime of taking body temperatures of beetles uh, and taking hourly counts of how many beetles were active, which I kind of knew 
from watching these darkling beetles uh, in the Mojave Desert and in Eastern Washington that they change uh, when they are active based on achieving a temperature in this range uh, of sort of cool temperatures. They don't get as hot as a lot of other temperatures. So 250 body temperatures that we took of beetles were in this cool range, so to speak. But to be able to operate in that range of an average body temperature, like room temperature, 68 Fahrenheit, no warmer than 86, these animals uh, were active in the daytime in the spring, in the nighttime in the summer, and then by fall, they were active in the daytime again. So they changed the time of day of their activity to fulfill kind of the thermal target they had for when they should be active. And uh, I apologize for taking so long, but I had to throw that in because my pet beetle that you'll see on the lizard table uh, is about a three-year-old beetle that I caught in the Albert Desert a couple of years, and I'd like you to meet my, my beetle friend. Well, uh, it's about time to stop telling you how beautiful the desert is. And I want to thank you for being my audience. And it's been a pleasure to come here and, and be part of the legacy of, of Doc Storm. So uh, I uh, have been called from the balcony uh, as uh, uh, somebody that belongs in the peanut gallery. And it's been a pleasure to, uh, to get to come down and tell you my story uh, from uh, an old professor just talking about his dissertation from a long time ago. So thank you very much. Oh, it's it's very late. I'm sorry, but I could take some questions and and our graduate students and others are out at the tables if you want to go out now even and look at the stuff on the table, but I'll be happy to answer if uh, anybody is able to stay so late at night now for any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that was a special thing we thought to throw in, and I think you've learned enough about mountain beavers too tonight. So uh, it may be time to go, and I'll I'll be hanging out there uh, by the books if you're interested in the book and happy to sign some books and chat with you out there. So I think that's probably enough given how late. Oh, I'll take a question over here. Uh, kangaroo rats. Well. For a lot of vertebrate animals in general, the average is always less than a year because most of the young don't make it because the owls eat them, the coyotes eat them. But there are individuals of many of these species that can live for two or three or four years. And for example, when you do a marked study like I did, uh, I was aware of some individuals who survived throughout a few, the entire three-year period that I was there. So, but when you do demography studies and talk about average lifespan, any kind of little lizard, any little mouse or whatever, most of the young die and don't make it to the next year. And it's always a small number, but that's why they produce so many every year. And that's why the numbers go up and down so much over the years is that there's a lot of loss to predation. Uh, uh, an interesting exception I mentioned this morning, for some reason, Bats have adjusted their life history. Many of our common bats that we have here to live 15 or 20 or 25 years. So go figure, a little mouse, a little bat, the bat lives 20 years, uh, the longest living. Many of the others uh, get killed by predators. But anyway, that's a quick longevity problem for small vertebrate animals. So anything else? Oh, back there. Um, so a lot of science changed since you did your dissertation work, which is like even how you did your dissertation in 1970s. What piece of technology do you wish that you had then that exists now? Yeah, okay. Well, the pit tag. The pit tag is a good way to tag animals. It's a lot easier than clipping toes or putting things in ears. Uh, the radioactive method of Geiger counter chasing and of of putting radioactive wire in, handling it, and wearing a lead vest, and doing things to protect myself so that I could have children someday. 
uh, was all a, a, a difficult thing. And, and that's long been stopped because we can put radio collars on little animals. So in the golden mallard ground squirrel studies I talked about this morning, we used a little collar around the neck with a little radio transmitter. Uh, people are also using internal body temperature loggers uh, that became better and smaller. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting telemetry. There are cam camera traps. And then I'll also say that there's a little bit too much technology because now people are going to gonna implant some stuff and put some things on the animals and go back and sit on their rear end in the lab at their computer and, and then use some artificial intelligence program to analyze the things that they get on the recorded animal. But you still have to go out and look at the doggone animals and see what they're doing. But there have been a lot of nice technology things. And then genetics. When I was a graduate student, they used, you talk about gene flow. You know what gene flow is. But we didn't know how genes flow in the environment uh, uh, quite a long time ago. But I imagine these genes, well, in my years as a curator, as I started working with students, everybody was studying the genetic characterization of populations in different areas and understanding dispersal, speciation and stuff in terms of genetics. So thank goodness for genomics and genetics and all this. But, uh, you know, sometime we'll move beyond uh, climate science and climate change genomics and there'll be new kinds of questions and things to discover and new technologies. But anyway, uh, I mentioned some of the things that uh, uh, would have saved a lot of time and it would have been fun, although they're costly that I didn't get to use when I was a graduate student. So, anything else? Any other philosophy you want to hear from the balcony? Oh, way back there is something. Thank you. Uh, uh, my question is a little bit more geared towards some of our undergraduate students because I had the privilege of working with Bob and some other folks in working the Vert Bio series yeah. in the fall term. Um, but can you briefly describe maybe some of the environmental conditions that were driving that convergent evolution that you saw across these other um, I guess rodent organisms that we're seeing that have like large feet, large auditory bulla that shortened or extended, I guess, nephron a little bit further? Like what are all these different desert climates driving? Mm -hmm. Well, the they're saying you've got to you've got to have economy of water or you'll dry up and, and you know, there, there's no drinking water out there. So you've got to get your water from the vegetation. Reproduction and lactation require a lot of water for the breeding season, but you've got to be able to survive in the non-breeding season. So the seed-eating kangaroo rats are great in these environments with their long loops of Henley at conserving water year round and eating a dry seed diet. You may also know something that has nothing to do with desert adaptation that's called metabolic water. When you take a, a gram of sugar and oxidize it, it produces energy. This is introductory chemistry. It produces carbon dioxide and it produces water. So the oxidation, the digestion and oxidation of food actually produces metabolic water which means that water is derived from the oxidation of the foodstuffs. Now, that's not anything tricky that desert rodents do, although some people describe that in a wrong way in a lecture and make it sound like only desert animals. We all produce metabolic water when we eat potato chips, you know, even though there's not a lot of water in it. Um, so I, I think the selective pressures are just the first three things I mentioned, uh, heat, aridity, and scarce resources. So you've got to have some special strategies for surviving and for being able to reproduce under those conditions. So um, actually Ernst Meyer, uh, 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 an important evolutionary biologist, as a guy that I met and spoke to two times in my life. One of them was a graduate student when I asked him about the tooth situation and what's going on there. And he underscored the importance as he did in a publication at the time of behavior setting up, the behavior will set up a selective pressure for a morphological adaptation. In other words, if you take the, the leaf and you, mm, I can't eat that, um, what can I do? And you scrape it and you develop some scraping behavior and then there has to be the mutated member of the next generation whose teeth are a little bit wider and doesn't go to the orthodontist to have it corrected, but allows them over successive mutations and selective pressures
to be a more successful individual by having a wider and more chisel tape. So I've just described the scenario of how a behavior uh, does uh, selective pressure for the evolution of a morphological change. And Ernst Meyer told me that, and I cited him in the science paper uh, for an occasion when he said that. So that's a long enough answer. Anything else, or it's time to go. All right, come on, you guys, you gotta go to bed and the kids, have, okay. If I, there is one question online that says, oh. what would you say is the appropriate place of the scientists' emotions in natural history studies like yours? Oh, a question from a philosopher, somebody who is uh, hidden to us, and I don't need to know who it is, but I was kind of baiting you with that. So the question was, uh, what, what is the role of emotion in science? Well, uh, we can use emotion to appreciate science. I think my statement was that uh, an emotional response is an appreciation uh, that can drive an enthusiasm and a curiosity just to know what's happening. And that's not hypothesis testing. That's just curiosity. And some people just like to go out and, and look at birds or look at lizards and try to ask questions about what's going on. So uh, everybody, including non-scientists, has emotional responses to animals. And some of us scientists think that some of those emotional uh, responses, the joyous love of a puppy dog, or the reason you have a kitty in your home, uh, or whatever, is just emotion. It's not very scientific, but we can't say that we scientists are so purely scientific that we don't have emotions. So I'm kind of willing to out myself as somebody who has emotions. <laughs> I'm out. That's enough. Okay, thank you.